Alrighty, well good afternoon and welcome to Learning in Communities, Personal Librarians in our FYE implementation. As you know, I'm Denise. These are my colleagues. I'm Tiffany Davis. And Derek Sanders. Okay, we plan to provide a little background, describe how we selected our learning outcomes and in taught information literacy competencies, assessment, what we've learned, and how we plan to proceed in the future. Are there any questions about what we, we plan to discuss with you guys today? Okay, um, I have a question for you guys though. How many of you have an FYE implementation in place at your institution? Oh, we have a few. a few. Excellent, very good to hear. All right, so maybe we'll hear something at the questions and answers about your implementations. I want to give you a little background about where we come from. Uh, Mount St. Mary College was founded in 1950, so we're relatively young in the, the, the college uh, age ranges. We're located on the Hudson River in Newburgh, New York. We're a four-year liberal arts college. We have 19 academic majors, and we have master's degrees offered in business, nursing, and education. Traditionally, we, re we have relied on one-shot instruction sessions um, with faculty that reached out to us. In some cases, we reached out to them as well. But we wanted to integrate information literacy into a more systematic approach, especially with our freshmen. So we turned to a personal librarian model in 2013. We continued to rely on those one-shot sessions with the rest of the student population, but we wanted to try something with potentially more impact on our first semester freshmen. We developed a personal librarian pilot in the fall of 2013. The project was a collaborative effort with our arts and letters faculty, and the goal was to consistently teach information literacy skills across the first semester freshman population. We developed five online tutorials, and students were required to view those. We also provided an in-classroom instruction session on database searching. Each section of English 101, which on our campus is college writing, had a librarian assigned to them as their personal librarian. The pilot was very well received across campus. In fact, we had other courses, faculty would come to us and say, but we want our own personal librarian. <laughs> So, you know, it, it, was, it was nice to see that positive um, interaction. So um, when the college began planning their implementation of a first-year experience type program, personal librarians were included. So we had that foundation where we had that, that great reception across campus, and we, we think that that was an important part of what happened to us last year. Um, the college pursued to LEAP, Liberal Education and America's Promise, High Impact Practices. Um, FYEs generally bring small groups of students together to meet with faculty or with staff regularly. Helps the students to make those connections, to build the relationships with different parts of the campus community. The learning communities allow, uh, um, provide an opportunity for a small group of students to be in two classes, across two courses, I guess it's more accurate. Furthermore, it supports the integration of in learning across those two courses. Sometimes this may involve a common reading or a discussion topic. In our FYE program, general education courses were paired so that the same 20 or so students would attend the same two classes together. And this was our learning communities. Um, our FYE was engineered to create a robust program with many facets and areas of involvement across the campus to demonstrate to our first year students the variety of supports that they had for them. Um, we had academic coaches from the Center for Student Success, there were um, tutors from the Writing Center, and of course, their personal librarian. Um, in addition, Student Affairs, the Writing Center, and the Center for Student Support, uh, so Student Success also developed um, particular programs that were a part of the FYE, and students were required to attend any four of them. Each learning community was formed of those two courses that were general education program courses. Usually they were English 101, again, college writing, 
and a disciplinary course. That could be something like uh, psychology, history, anatomy and physiology, and so on. The faculty involved in the learning community and the librarians were expected to meet to discuss how the students were doing, um, how content could be addressed in the courses, and anything else that arose during the course of the semester. In my case, my learning communities were all pairings of English 101 and Anatomy and Physiology, or A&P. Given the nature of A&P's content, I don't know if you know, you're familiar with those kinds of courses, but it's, it's really content heavy and very memorized, memorization based. And the faculty for A&P felt that he couldn't give up one second for me to come in and do anything for the learning community on the A&P side. So all of my attention was done in English 101. But he did a lot of content and, and suggestions for the research components and essays that the students were dealing with in English 101. Um, for instance, um, euthanasia, organ donation, and freezing eggs. They all, they all came from um, our A&P faculty. Um, the English 101 faculty were very supportive and very willing to change how their courses were going to be handled so that it could meet the needs of the program, which was really very helpful to, to see that flexibility. <clears throat> um, each learning community had a, a LibGuide so that the students could go there and find everything that they needed to handle each side of the course. Um, they were encouraged, learning communities were encouraged to develop an out of class event. So in the case of my communities, um, together we developed a visit to New York City to see the Body Worlds exhibit, which you know kind of fits in with AMP. Um, and then we met weekly, um, the AMP faculty and the English 101 faculty and myself, where we went over the content, how we're going to do assessment, outcomes, and anything else that came up. So in addition to these pairings, there were also some pairings of general psychology with anatomy and physiology and general psychology with intro to Western Europe. I was the personal librarian for the general psychology and A&P pairing, so I would like to talk a little bit about my experience there with you for a moment. Um, my experience was similar to Denise's in some ways, but also varied, especially with the level of participation of both of the faculty members. Uh, where everyone in Denise's group, they met weekly. Um, the AMP professor contributed all those great ideas to the conversation. That didn't happen in my case. Um, Sarah Uzelik, who was the professor for general psychology, she was very involved. Uh, she came up with the ideas of how to change her course around to better match with A&P. She looked through when each course would be administering tests and assessment and rearrange things so the students wouldn't be having like two tests on the same day or the same week. Um, she also wanted to meet with me regularly and she was the one that spearheaded the designing of the out of classroom activity. So she was very involved and she also was very, very willing to incorporate me and information literacy into her course, into her classroom. But as I said, the person teaching A&P, however, he was very removed from the pairing. Uh, he did not contribute many ideas. He did not want to week meet weekly. Um, he, what was most shockingly, I guess, was that a lot of times Sarah would email both of us and he wouldn't even respond to her emails. So that's kind of something that I think really detracted from the success of the pairing, is his lack of involvement. I do think that it may have something to do with the fact that he was an adjunct professor, um, so he's not on campus like she was and you know maybe not as invested. But though it was successful, unsuccessful in that way, we had a lot of success with the information literacy curriculum in the course. For example, uh, we included five video tutorials, which I'll talk about in more depth a little bit later. And I also came into the classroom three times. Uh, I came in first to introduce myself, and at which point I also talked about the first year experience program and information literacy, why they were important to the students. Uh, the next time I came in, I talked about source validity and we mostly looked at websites. And then the last time I came in, we did some database searching. I did a demo and then we spent time practicing where students were on laptops and I could go around the room and guide them with their database searching. 
And in addition to that, Sarah also, the professor for general psychology, she included a, a lesson from the Writing Center director, which I thought was really great because it allowed students to see yet another support service on our campus and also obviously provide them with skills and, and tips to improve their writing. So though the pairing was sex, sex, successful, I can't say that word today, uh, in many ways, uh, I thought it could have been an even greater experience for our students and a more well-rounded experience for our students if both of the faculty members had been equally involved. Okay. Uh, up here you can see some, a few of our other pairings. Uh, one I'm going to highlight uh, that I worked with was the college writing intro to criminology. It was by far the most successful pairing I had. Um, and the bulk of the work I did was with the Intro to Criminology section, as a matter of fact. Uh, I made one visit uh, to the class where we talked, the instructor and I talked a lot about the difference between qualitative and quantitative research and how to find an article of that type, how to identify its components. Uh, the students from those classes also visited the library twice where they had uh, directed activities that the class instructor had already created so they could work on those but also receive our support while we were there. Uh, the college writing class I went into once at the beginning of the semester simply to introduce myself, the FYE program. Uh, but of course what you have to keep in mind is that all students are getting those sessions so it doesn't necessarily matter, uh, from my perspective at least, um, which section that's occurring in. It's more a matter of what the instructor could give, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other thing we did for this pairing was we had a film screening of the movie Dead Man Walking because the theme of the criminology class uh, and the college writing class was social justice. Um, and that collaboration was another interesting piece and, and I think another reason the collaboration worked well is that Criminology lends itself naturally, of course, to a, a discussion of criminal justice, but the college writing instructor had to more or less give up what she normally would have made her cl course content to work with that social justice theme. And so it was kind of that willingness for people to do things a bit differently, uh, including myself, uh, that really helped that pairing uh, be a success. Uh, one of the other pairings I had was the one at the bottom there, Intro to Sociology with Computer Literacy. That was a much less successful pairing um, in large part because there was less of that willingness to collaborate, willingness to do things differently. Um, and to a degree, it's harder to modify that content and connect that kind of content. Yes? Administrative and scheduling decisions, yeah, I mean a lot, it, they tried to pair a lot of it w so there was a content course with a course like college writing that could be more flexible in its content, but and obviously that didn't always, also, always happen. Also, um, they tried to pair the <coughs> disciplinary course to align with the student's major so that they, these students who are forming relationships in the learning community would see each other in their other courses throughout their years there. Um, a lot was thrown in the air when scores from like standardized testing came in and because of that they may have tested out of certain classes so then we had to kind of rearrange and that's when these more like creative <laughs> pairings <laughs> came about. Yeah. Yes? Do students choose these classes or are they just placed in them? They're placed in them. I uh, think overall it was a challenge for registrar and also yeah. the you know, administrators that were overseeing the FYE program. But um, hopefully since we, they tried to align them with the student's major, hopefully these were classes they wanted to take anyway. And like I said, a lot of them are in the core curriculum, gen ed courses, so many times they were required. Um, I'm sorry if you said this, but was there an actual FYE course or is the program consistent no. with these two? Okay. The FYE was the learning community okay. along with the required events that they had to attend. And the, the one thing I would just add to what I've been saying here is that, um, you know, the course, that, the course pairing that was less successful, um, I, I learned a lot from that lack of success and, and from the success in the other pairing that I can bring forward now uh, to discuss these future pairings 
uh, which we're going to be doing very soon for the fall semester. So it's, you know, it's a learning experience for everybody. And sometimes when those mistakes happen, you actually learn more than when it's a great success. So, yes. I need to speak up more and advocate more for not only myself, but the library and what we can provide. Okay. All right, moving on our journey here. <laughs> building the learning community. Um, just let me say that it has been likened our experience to uh, building the airplane while it's in flight. <laughs> it was a hurried implementation our first meeting as learning communities was in July. Classes started on our campus in August. Each librarian worked with their paired faculty and the courses to create this customized learning experience for the student groups. We all met in one room. That's actually kind of when we met for the first time um, and, and, and exchanged you know, ideas for syllabi. Uh, we had um, goals of the program, some of the requirements. Um, they were explained to us. Then we split off, talked about how we could uh, take those goals, how we could apply them to, to our, our different learning communities. Um, we looked at a list of general education outcomes, which ones did we feel our learning community could deal with and, 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 and uh, go from there. Um, then we started thinking about common topics. And, and for my group, that's where the uh, euthanasia, organ donation, and freezing eggs topics came from was, was out of that because um, the English 101 was was restructuring their their whole content so they, they really needed to have those topics so they could start thinking about where they were going to place their assignments that would be a, around those research topics. They reorganized timelines um, for the instructional content, identified uh, opportunities for events that would be out of the classroom so that they could attend them as a group and keep that learning community connection going. Um, the librarians and the teaching faculty also discussed which information literacy skills should be incorporated into the learning community. So we looked at the, the syllabi, we discussed the assignments that, that were there, um, we worked together to identify uh, and sometimes design information literacy content that would be appropriate for the learning communities. And we had identified some learning outcomes that could be potentially included. And what might they be? Well, here are some of them. Um, we came up with 11 information literacy learning outcomes appropriate for first year students and mapped to the ACRL information literacy competency standards for higher education. Now, we knew we couldn't cover them all, but the variety at least meant that we could have the opportunity to best mesh with our learning communities and the objectives so that it gave us that flexibility, which was helpful. If I could turn pages, it would be helpful. Um, faculty were supportive of the learning objectives as a whole, which really made our job much easier. We didn't have to fight that battle. So it, it, it was nice. We had other battles to fight. We didn't have that one. So I will move, and you're up. OK. So obviously, 11 objectives is a lot of objectives. And how are we, were we going to teach them all? Uh, well, we weren't um, in each pairing where we worked together with our faculty. We chose the ones that worked best with the, with the course. Um, in some cases, though, we did select a lot of learning outcomes, which meant that we would not be able to teach all of them in like our traditional in-class lecture format. We would have to approach them in a blended format, which meant that some of them would be taught in class. We would focus on more challenging topics and concepts where there would be an opportunity for students to ask questions, maybe do some hands-on work. Um, that we felt would be very important. And it also is important to have that in-class presence when you're trying to have a personal connection with the students with our personal librarian program. But in addition to that, we built online information literacy tutorials. We made those available to the librarians and to the teaching faculty to integrate into their course. So these would be an introduction to some of maybe the more basic skills and concepts that we could then either reinforce uh, in the classroom or with some sort of activity. So I want to talk a little bit about our experience with the tutorials. 
Um, first of all, the software we used. We used Articulate Storyline. I don't know if some of you, have you heard of that software? Do you use it? No? Okay. Well, we first learned about it actually at a conference. Um, Denise and I went to NERCOMP, it was the 2014 annual conference in Rhode Island. Uh, there we heard librarians from Bryant University. Bryant University in the house? Oh, there we go. Well, I'm not there, oh. but I know what you're talking okay. about. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, who talked about how they used this software to design like a virtual tour of their library, their website, and this helped them to implement like a flipped classroom method. It sounded great. Uh, we liked what we saw, so Denise and I brought it back and we decided to trial it at our library. And after getting feedback from all the librarians and the director, we decided that this would be a good software for us to use. So we purchased one license of it, which we would share. Um, but in addition to figuring out how we were going to create the tutorials, we also had to figure out how we were going to provide access to our tutorials. And we ended up changing our website and going with a vendor, so we didn't have a place where we could host them ourselves on a server. So we had a chat with our information technology department, and what they suggested we use was Google Drive. And here what you can do when you make a tutorial, it produces a folder of like output files, and you upload that to Google Drive and make a couple of changes, and then you can have a link uh, that you can embed in your web page or in a library guide, which we embedded them in library guides for the course. So that's the method that we decided to pursue. So now I just want to go over the tutorials a little bit of what the content of the tutorials were. So the first one in the series focused on developing a topic and identifying key terms. We addressed outcomes uh, two and three in this tutorial. Here we used the process of inquiry to explore topic development. And we also talked about and gave examples of topics that were too broad or too narrow and different ways that you can adjust your topic to achieve more of a middle ground. We use the questions who, what, where, when, and why to develop an example a thesis statement that we felt was comprehensive. And then those questions were also used again to help students to identify what the key terms and phrases were in that thesis statement. After identifying the key terms, we discussed the importance of synonyms and related terms when you're searching for sources. And then we concluded with a review of everything we went over in the tutorial. We did this in every single tutorial, a conclusion of a review of what was covered, and then we had an assessment to test students' recall of information. So next in the series was Credo versus Wikipedia, which focused on reference sources for finding background information. In this one, we addressed outcomes one, two, and four. And we tried to, in general, introduce a, a healthy dose of skepticism when facing information and sources, um, and in particular when looking at Wikipedia. We defined reference sources and why you would want to use a reference source, what purpose they serve. We talked about Wikipedia and a couple of the reasons why their professors don't like them to use it, because you, know, you don't, can't always determine who the author of the article is, for one. Um, but then we also included some other explanations as well. We talked to them in the tutorial about Credo Reference and said it's kind of a more scholarly alternative to Wikipedia where it has a whole bunch of different reference sources you can use um, and also those great topic pages which kind of mimic what a Wikipedia page looks like. And when we were developing these tutorials, we tried our best to incorporate as much like interactive functions as possible. So for example, we included buttons. I'm gonna try to use the pointer. Buttons. So when you click on these things, they give you a little bit more information about each kind of source. Uh, we also had hotspots that they, when clicked, they would advance the slide, um, drag and drop activities, and then an assessment. Next, we addressed outcomes two and nine in the scholarly versus popular articles tutorial. And here, we obviously, we defined the different types of sources and we gave some basic hints on how they could identify if a source was popular or scholarly. We talked about the differences between the two and when you might want to use one or the other. 
And we finally talked about the peer review process, what it entails, and why it matters to them. And as always, an assessment followed this tutorial. Um, this one in particular prepared students for their English 101 coursework, where all the students needed to write an annotated bibliography and use both kinds of sources. Outcomes 6 and 11 were introduced in the citation tutorial that we developed. Here we talked about why it's important to cite sources. We defined plagiarism and its consequences in higher ed. I know probably none of you have experiences with your students plagiarizing, but that's something that happens on our campus, so we had to address it. Um, we talked about the common features of citations, and then we walked them through citing a book and a scholarly article in APA style. That's the style that the English faculty use, not MLA. That is different, but that's OK. Um, then what we did is we used the citation for the scholarly article and showed students how to find that citation in our databases, find the full text of that article just using that citation. And again, we tried to incorporate, incorporate interactive features like more animations and assessments and also screen recordings. And like I said, plagiarism is something that's very important on our campus and we wanted to address it, so we thought that this would be the most appropriate place to talk about it. And our final tutorial in the series was about evaluating websites. Uh, it addressed outcomes seven and eight. It was our longest tutorial, and perhaps because it covers a topic of great relevance to our student population, uh, they all want to use websites in their bibliographies as sources. So what we decided to do is use the CRAP system, which maybe you've heard of. Uh, it was first developed by librarians at California State University at Chico. Thought it was memorable. Mm -hmm. um, it stands for Currency, Relevance, Accuracy, Authority, and Purpose. And what we did, since this was such a long tutorial, we made a menu where each of those little boxes is a button. And when you click on the button, it takes you to a just explanation of the concept and then they're walked through how to apply the concept to a website. So other things that we included besides the buttons that were a little more interactive were more screen recordings, hotspots, and an assessment. So I want to talk a little bit about Storyline, our experiences with Storyline and things we liked and didn't like about it. First of all, what we liked, it looks a lot like the Microsoft Office suite of products where think like that ribbon and then the different tabs for the different tools. So that was very helpful. It helped you, me in particular to feel like I was using something I was already familiar with. I knew where to look for some things. So that really helped to minimize the learning curve when getting used to this new software. Uh, we also really enjoyed the visual organization of the slides. So when you're looking at the progression of your tutorial, you can see it and kind of, it looks like almost like a family tree or a mind map kind of layout. So you can make sure your slide is branching to all the appropriate slides that it could link to. It really helps you to visually see how your tutorial is being organized. It was very, very easy to incorporate those activities with these things called triggers and pre-made activities like drag and drop activities that you could just throw in to your uh, tutorial. Then we liked the characters too. Um, you saw a character on the citation slide. Uh, they just kind of added a little bit of personalization we felt that you can choose oh, from. Right. Uh, <laughs> it was supposed to be a blend of all of us, but I couldn't blend a male one with a, <laughs> with a female one, so that kind of was a challenge. But um, yeah, so we thought that that was really nice. They also come with a whole bunch of different expressions, so when you layer them on top of each other, they can change expression when like some new information, so they can be shocked or frustrated or something like that. So that was really nice. Um, and then also the ease with which assessment could be incorporated. You, there were pre-made assessments like multiple choice or fill in the blanks or short answers that you just threw in and changed your wording, so you would change it to the, your appropriate question and select all of your answers. Um, 
ways for reporting the assessment back. You could send it to a learning management system. Or what you could do by just clicking a button was have the students print a results page, which was handy for both us and for the students because they could see the answers they got incorrect and see the actual correct answer. Um, so they could learn a little bit from their mistakes there. So we ended up going with the printing results page. Things we didn't like so much, uh, this goes for tutorials in general. The amount of time it takes to make them is immense. Um, you have to write the script, you have to find all of the images you want to incorporate, you have to think about the interactive features you want to add, record the audio, make sure everything's all synced up, and then whenever there's issues, go back and upkeep it, or if you make a change to the website, you have to go back and change that. So there's a lot of time and energy involved in making these tutorials. With Storyline in particular, we had some inconsistencies in the performance of a couple of features. For example, with the quizzing function, I was just talking about the printing a results page. For some reason, in all except one tutorial, it, wanted to, it worked fine. This one tutorial, it did not want to print the results page. Like the button was there, but when you clicked it, nothing happened. Um, so that was odd. And then another thing that happened was they have this option to embed web objects, which is, sounds really cool. So what you can do is embed a live website into your tutorial so that you can have students explore it and not leave the tutorial environment, which sounds really great when doing web evaluation, right? So we wanted to incorporate it there. Everything looked fine in the preview function, but once you went to publish the tutorial, all you were met with was an empty box. It's really strange. So we consulted with Articulate Support, who normally was very, very helpful with every other problem that we came in contact with. But for these two situations, we could not figure out what was happening. So that was a disappointment. Uh, lastly, we used Google Drive to host the tutorials. Uh, in the spring, they migrated to like a new version of itself. And when they did this, our tutorials wouldn't play anymore. So after about two weeks, they figured out whatever was causing the problem and everything worked fine again. But for those two weeks, um, there was a section of English 101 that wanted to use the tutorials and they couldn't use them. So thus, in general, we were more satisfied than dissatisfied with Storyline. And a lot of the problems that we had are just problems that you get dealing with technology in general. They're not Storyline specific. So we liked the software. So it was also important um, that in addition to the tutorials that we had that in-person presence I was talking about before, since we we're trying to be personal librarians, we want to put a face to the name. So it was important that we go to the classroom or have the class come to the library. And that happened in all of the sections. We either went to the classroom or they came to the library. Um, when developing how we were going to uh, structure our course, we worked very closely with the, with the teaching faculty. They helped us to determine what outcomes they thought would be appropriate for their course, uh, when it would be appropriate to address them, time, you know, timing them with assignments, since it's so important to try to tie information literacy assignment uh, instruction with assignments. Um, also, how to address them. And because of this close collaboration, it was great for forming relationships with the teaching faculty, but it also led to very different experiences from each learning community to each learning community. So we were teaching different things. It varied greatly. But there were a few topics that everybody did teach in class uh, with great consistency. We all went over database searching in class. This is something that was important for, for all the courses. They all had to find sources for either an annotated bibliography or some sort of research paper. We all discussed source validity with different types of sources. And third, we all talked about parts of a research article. Once we found the research article, we went over the different components. So overall, there were 59 instruction sessions that were taught in the FYE. And some other topics that were covered besides those three included, we actually taught how to write the annotated bibliography in some sessions, catalog searching, citation, popular versus scholarly articles, 
quantitative versus qualitative research articles, search strategy, and website evaluation. Okay. So I'm going to talk quite a bit about uh, assessment. Uh, this was something new for us, uh, the extent of the assessment necessary. Uh, we normally at the end of each information individual information literacy session give out a little survey that we then uh, bring back and report um, ter terms of year and statistics but this was something much more extensive um, so I will tell you a little of what we did um, we went about it in several different ways uh, there were of course the quizzes at the end of the tutorials uh, that everybody used um, some people used a citation analysis assignment uh, as a form of ass assessment um, other people used a grade on a series of assignments related to things covered in the information literacy sessions and uh, then some people used a year-end or a semester-end quiz uh, for each learning community to assess um, so tutorial use I will start with here um, through collaborating with the individual faculty in our learning communities, we all decided or decided not to use these tutorials uh, that Tiffany just spoke about. Um, so 14 of 23 learning communities decided to use the tutorials. And as you can see here, uh, the breakdown, uh, popular versus scholarly articles uh, was used 14 times. Uh, developing topic, identifying key terms, and identifying components of a citation was used 11 times each and the last two credo versus wikipedia and evaluating websites were used six times each so clearly the popular versus scholarly was seen as the most important in these cases yeah what do you mean by use? Like they, incorporated it as an assignment for the they incorporated it into okay. the course yeah so for example one one section could one learning community could have used popular versus scholarly and developing a topic but not the other three or some variation on that so, am i correct in understanding that you said 14 used one of them at least one. one yeah so used at least one um almost half didn't then mm -hmm. yeah close to it third. yeah 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 you're uh, correct And then uh, we'll look at student performance on the tutorial assessment, those are the quizzes at the end of each tutorial. Um, three learning communities used these assessments to uh, formally evaluate learning. The quizzes were available to everybody, but some of the communities used them as extra credit or something like that if the students actually completed the quiz. Um, student performance on these assessments when formally used was excellent. Uh, the lowest average score was a 90 percent um, so overall they did very well on these uh, as far as end of the semester assessment uh, was concerned uh, quizzes were administered to 12 learning communities sort of an overall quiz uh, evaluating everything covered in the learning community uh, eight learning communities used an annotated bibliography assignment as a way of evaluating what was learned what wasn't learned and one learning community used a uh, research assignment um, of a more broad nature to assess what was learned and it was I if memory serves a formal research paper in that case so the average score on assessment by learning community uh, the lowest score uh, was a 61 percent the highest was a 96 the mean was an 80 percent with the mode being an 82 percent so overall the performances were pretty solid uh, concerning these assessments these are including everything the quizzes the annotated bibliography scores the research paper score whatever the person reported as their end of year information literacy assessment And then uh, research consultations were a very, very important part of this. Uh, they're an important part of the information literacy we do in general, but we particularly emphasize them in uh, the FYE. 
since these are first year students, many of them being exposed to this type of material for the very first time. Um, and so these results are kind of disappointing to us uh, since we emphasized it so much. Only 35 students uh, took advantage of the research consultation service. That was out of almost uh, 400 total students uh, who participated in the FYE. Um, and that's out of a total of 120 research consultations, including FYE and the uh, regular information literacy sessions. So FYE students made up 29% of total research consultations, only 9% of FYE students total used research consultations. Um, so we're disappointed with these figures. Uh, one thing we're considering requiring in the future, uh, depending on whether we can co coordinate it with the faculty members, is requiring that at least some sort of contact is made with the librarian and the learning community. I'm sorry, is 120 total personal research lessons for the fall? The for fall. the fall yeah. semester. For the whole campus. Right. For the whole campus, yeah. How did you know which ones we had a roster of our students. I mean, because we each had, what, six sections of these learning communities. So whatever, six so times 20 is. We had a lot of students <laughs> in the FYE. We didn't know all their names. So we had rosters. So we would take, you usually record the student's name, their major, and what course it's for, their assignments for. And then we could check against the roster oh, so and say, you, you know. Take at every research consultation? Yeah. 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 Yeah, and we particularly emphasized it with the FYE since we wanted to see what the participation would be like. Yes? I have two questions. One, so if there are like 400 students who said, are you guys prepared to have 400 research consultations? No, and that's, that's why we said contact. <laughs> contact. Uh, email yeah. us to ask about like, you know, what's happening with the tutorial or something like that. Just some sort of contact maybe yeah. made just so they know we're here and we could tell them about the services that we offer. We just want to ingrain in them since they're freshmen that we're here their whole college career and we can help them in any course. Right. And so then, my other question, sorry, is for the annotated bibliography, did the professor create it for content and then you guys create it and that's how you got your grade for information literacy or how did that work? Well, since six of them were mine, okay. um, yeah. <laughs> we, we, I spoke with the, the teaching faculty and how we were going to uh, assess the information literacy part, and he required that they um, meet the citation format and also that they entered which database they used. Mm -hmm. And then he actually, if we came up with the rubric, he used that to grade his annotated bibliography for information literacy and then gave me the grades. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I, I, I had to trust the two <laughs> English uh, one-on-one professors that, that, you know, they were following that. And they, they asked me some questions, so I'm pretty sure that, you know, we, we were as good as we were going to get. <laughs> yes. It's, it's only the fall semester of freshman year at this point. Yeah. No, not at this point. Uh, it's something we're working towards, I think, as a college, but yeah, it's it's not in place. I do have one other question. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, we brought the outcomes and we said, read these. <laughs> and I'll explain any <laughs> that you need me to explain. Um, I don't think we have a written policy about information literacy, no. except for on our web page, you know. And middle states. Page. And middle states, you know, encourages it. We, we, so we, accredited, we, that's important. We're very fortunate, and our director will say that she's been there, what, nine years? We're all, mm -hmm. We've all been there less than nine years. When she came to the college, um, you know, the information literacy was already very important to everybody, so okay. we don't have to fight that battle. Okay. Part of the culture. Exactly. Yeah. That was my question, is, is there any history was it all uh, an accreditation initiative that really got people on board, or did you know anything about the early history of that? And we, did the FYE lost start it. because of accreditation? The yeah. FYE started because of retention. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's those. It's listed as a, you know a high impact practice for retention. So I think we have a retention rate of like 82 or 83 percent. Mm -hmm. And they want we want to increase it. So that's where that came from. Are you thinking about? 
first year, first semester, and what kind of components I mean, it's something to think about, definitely. Though there are five of us, there's five librarians at Mount St. Mary College, so and four, it was, there was four this last year. So it, it's definitely a heavy load in the fall to be this, say, doing three sessions for one of my six learning communities, you know, doing that same thing for every single one. Um, it's kind of a heavy load. If we could do something maybe in the spring, <laughs> that, would, that would be beneficial. But we do want to see more information literacy embedded in upper level courses um, and with the honors program. So that's something we're looking into. Okay. So um, at the end of the semester, there was also a survey given to students uh, that assessed the entire first year experience, not just uh, the personal library and faculty aspect of it. And that included um, attending required events of an academic nature, you know, sessions on how to write better, um, how not to plagiarize, that type of thing work with academic coaches, work with the writing center that's on campus. Um, so here's the first question that students were asked uh, about their uh, confidence in their ability to do academic research after interacting with us. Um, we're more or less happy with this, I think. Um, you know, a 50% here or roughly thereabouts. Um, especially keeping in mind many of these are brand new students just being introduced to these concepts. Um, I think it gives us something to work with, you know, if we can expand the program to another semester uh, in the spring or something of that nature, it, it definitely gives us something to build on. Um, but we do want to see more, obviously. I'm sorry? It was handed out to all of the freshman students, and I think the response rate was very, very high because they did it in class. Mm -hmm. But not 100% of the students in the FYE took the, the survey at the end of the year. And then uh, this question, the support provided by the personal librarian was helpful in completing my coursework. Uh, we had a 51% positive response in this case. Um, this is one area uh, again, where I think we could see some improvement, um, but considering the nature of the students. And, and I should mention, too, most of Mount St. Mary College's students are first-year students, so these are students not necessarily coming from academic families or from families first who... First generation. First generation, yeah. I didn't say first year. You said first year, but that's first okay. Year. We're saying first year a lot in this presentation, so it's natural. <laughs> okay, okay. I didn't even notice. <laughs> okay, and then they were asked whether they saw the connection uh, between their library instruction and the course content. Uh, nearly 50% did, um, which was a good thing because we definitely tried to tie in uh, our purpose for being in the classroom or the student's purpose for visiting the library to a specific assignment rather than just introducing it as some random concept at the beginning or the middle of the semester or something like that. And then uh, we had this question that I would be likely to contact my personal librarian in the future. Um, only 38% gave some kind of positive response to this, so we're, we're quite disappointed in that. And we really would like to find a way to um, make this connection more for students. Um, I think one thing we have going on here, at least from personal experiences, I'm in charge uh, currently of uh, access services, so I work a lot with our work-study students, and a lot of them will come and ask me questions because they know me. But I think in their minds, they're not thinking that they're asking their personal librarian or even a librarian a question. They're just asking somebody they know that question. So I think something like this doesn't necessarily register with them on that level, per se. Yeah, remember only 35 right. students 
use a, a research consultation. Right. Um, what this survey was part of a huge survey for the yeah. FYE in general. Yeah. So it was very limiting, like the amount of questions that we could ask. And I think there were a lot of flaws in the design of the survey. And I was on the FYE task force, and everyone on the task force kind of admits that if we had had a little bit more time to develop the survey, maybe it could have been a, a little bit better. Maybe consult with some of our social sciences people who are more used to <laughs> building these kinds of things. Right. Um, so no, these are just the questions on there that related to the library, but again, there were other questions that related to the Writing Center, Center for Student Success, learning communities in general, their teaching faculty, you know, so it was a very big survey. Right. Well, what we do is each full-time librarian personally tracks the number of like research consultations, like I said, the name, the major, all that. But we do have a lot of part-time reference people working the reference desk, and they don't track that. They just record in Zoho, which is our statistics management software. I had a research consultation. They don't re take the name of the student, which I think is something we should do in the future. That's something that maybe some foresight would have been beneficial in that case. Yeah, and it would simply take more effort on their part also to actually ask that question. Are there privacy concerns with taking the name of the student? Uh, yeah, true. Maybe we could, um, yeah, that's true. Well, we could simply ask yeah. if they're involved in the FYE program. Yeah, maybe we could do that. Yeah. Not the content of their research work. Could be the subject of the research query, but just not the name of the yeah, so we could ask, are you in the FYE? And this is stuff, like, we obviously don't report the name of the student in our own statistics. We report their major and things like that. But we keep it so we can reach out to them and have them fill out a survey that assesses their, their level of happiness and satisfaction with the research consultation. So that's why we personally report the name. Yes? Do you do anything to sell your program to parents? The idea of you know, when your kid calls up and says, oh, oh I have this terrible research project to do and it's killing me <laughs> to have them say, why don't you go talk to your personal librarian? Well, I've had parents call me yeah. to ask questions <laughs> for their students. <laughs> <laughs> That's as close as we've had. But I think yeah. that is important, especially, like yeah. we said, with first-generation students. Parents may not know who to call. So right. if we could somehow get that ourselves integrated into uh maybe new student day or something orientation. Like or orientation, yeah. orientation, you know, something like that. It could be beneficial. Yes. Oh, I, you're going to be doing this next fall too, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So last fall was the first time? Last fall was the very first time, you know, it was a, a quick and late implementation. So, so what, there's a lot to learn. What will you do differently this fall, do you think? We are, we are getting there. Well, that's <laughs> the next slide. <laughs> As a matter of fact, <laughs> thank you. But if you have if you have follow-ups to this, please ask. Um, I think the first thing we want to do differently, or the first thing we will be doing differently, is a different approach to the tutorials. Uh, we've recently purchased something called uh, Credo Information Literacy Tutorials. It's a tutorial package where they essentially design the tutorials for us according to. Uh, the different uh, ACRL standards we want to emphasize, different types of research skills uh, we want students to have. That takes uh, a lot of the work away from us um, and allows us to do things in different areas. Of course, it also adds a certain amount of content uh, for the instructors in the class. Uh, tutorials on plagiarism, things like that can be designed. Um, and they're made by professionals, you know, not librarians in there non-spare time. Um, we also need, again, thinking about some way to require students to at least make contact with us. Um, a personal example is I work with a Sociology 101 online course at Mount St. Mary College. The instructor in that course requires her students to make contact with me, uh, but what often happens is they simply email me or call me you know, it takes five or ten minutes to get the student uh, to what they want. And um, so they're making contact, they're making that connection, they're hopefully coming back later, but it's not something that becomes uh, burdensome 
with you know all 25 students coming into the course or coming into the library or something like that. It's usually less than half who actually come in and want to sit down with me. So it's manageable. Um, the other thing I think we, we want to work on more is consistency. We were all working with, um, not just because of our learning communities, but because of the newness of it all, we were all diff working with very different ideas of how we wanted to approach uh, information literacy instruction, how we wanted to assess it. I mean, you could see the variety of ways we assessed it there. It was kind of a jumble. Uh, so we want to somehow uh, find a more consistent way to do that. Uh, the credo package I mentioned will help us with that because they build assessment <coughs> into their tutorials and into their software. So once we've got that package together, it's automatically consistent across the board. Um, and there'll probably be more interesting things to report because of that, or at least more consistent things. Um, but we did use uh, LibGuides uh, as a way of attempting to maintain consistency. I mean, we all use this, this template. Uh, most of our LibGuides contain more or less the same amount of information or same type of information, just with minor modifications depending on the learning community we were in. So we, we, we did try to approach it uh, in that manner as much as we could. Um, so again, in terms of the future, um, we're looking at flipping the classroom in some manner by having uh, students view the tutorials before they come into class. So they view a tutorial on uh, database searching and then we do it in class. Uh, but hopefully they come in prepared with a topic, something we can really work with, rather than being introduced to it uh, for the very first time. Uh, so, oh, and this yeah. is just a little review of what we covered. I always forget this slide. <laughs> uh, so we gave you some background on uh, our campus and the FYE, talked a lot about learning outcomes and how we approach those um, and teaching IO uh, competencies. Talked a lot about assessment and of course lessons learned in the future. So if you have any more questions for us, we'd be happy to take them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it, it looked like all the librarians at your institution were doing this, whether yeah. they're reference instructor or not. So I'm sure that integrates with you guys. Well, yeah, and then a lot, I think all of us, in fact, had weekly or more or less weekly meetings with the instructors. Um, so we got to know a lot more about how students were performing, how they were responding to what we were doing. And, um, we got to know faculty a lot better too, which helps build relationships for doing things with upper level classes, et cetera, et cetera. Well, our personal librarian program that we had the year before was so well received and everybody wanted personal librarians that when they started planning FYE, they wanted to incorporate us into it. So, you know, we kind of... Yeah. Yes. They, they loved us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just thinking about the, uh, the assessment piece of the objectives. So to be clear, the, we had a shared rubric for all the objectives and then that was disseminated to the faculty and they were um, well, my piece with the annotated bibliography is that some of the librarians had quizzes that they that they gave out and then they graded. So how did you ensure consistency of grading? There's the problem. There's yeah. the problem. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of lack of consistency. Like, so, you know, 14 <coughs> learning communities, we used the tutorials. The others didn't. Um, maybe they just did most of their instruction in class. Some people went to class one time. Some people went to class three times. Um, and then basically everyone had to customize their assessment of to assess what students learned based on what they had done with this with the course. So that had to naturally be very different. And I was wondering how you would assess like assessing a tutorial different citations. Exactly. So. Right. Not yeah. generalizable. Yeah. yeah. And we, we we were thinking about it. 
we take a totally different path, actually going into resident health and making it, instead of really thinking about information literacy outcomes, we're thinking more about dispositions and just making it fun. <laughs> That's yeah. all we do. Like we, it hasn't really related so much to instruction. It's more of a, a giant reference interaction, <laughs> basically, is how we kind of see And it. I think historically, they're kind of more like that personal yeah. librarian programs. They're like come out of the personal banker model, kind of, where freshmen come in and they get emails saying, hey, we're here, we're your personal librarian, here for any questions you have. And they don't usually focus on information literacy. That was kind of our, our twist. Yeah. 